Yeah, so that that title is a long one. Uh, I don't think you could make an acronym out of that. Uh, but the the basic message we're going to try and provide you all here with tonight is uh, what is the CCS or the carbon storage potential for Arizona? What are our resources and how can we move forward in this kind of atmosphere? No pun intended. Um, I am the manager for the New Basin Analysis Group, and so I will be talking about our projects, where we are now, and where we kind of hope to be, and a little bit of outreach. And uh, then we have uh, Lisa following up after that. Lisa? Hi, Lisa Thompson. I uh, work with the Basin Analysis Research Group with Brian and Tanya. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Tanya Wilson, um, and tonight I'll be touching on our CUSP Focus project, um, an example of a CCS, CCS uh, potential storage site. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump on to the first slide. As uh, I assume most of you know, what our mission is at AZGS is that we produce uh, reports and geologic maps, and we provide those uh, characterization of our resources and our hazards. We provide those to the, the stakeholders and the communities in our state, including our state and tribal governments and our so, uh, civil and emergency uh, managers. Um, so we've been doing this for a while since a territory of the state. We've, we've fallen under different auspices of mineral, economic, geology, geologic mapping, and only recently that we started this new section called Basin Analysis. Um, it just gives us a, a name although we've been doing basin analysis over the last 30 years or so. Um, and so what we're able to do with that is leverage our experts like Lisa and Tanya uh, and others on the, the realm of <clears throat> stratigraphy and structural geology, sedimentology in this uh, space uh, in the subsurface. So our goal tonight is to introduce to you about what CCS is, what it stands for, and why we're doing it, and what project we're involved with now. And that's the first part. Lisa will talk about our subsurface resources in the state, and then how those look in, a sea, in an ecosystem when combined with other aspects of the subsurface and energy transition that we're in. And then uh, after that, Tanya will focus on Harquahela. It's a basin in the southwestern part of the state and what a CCS project would look like. It's in its infancy, uh, so uh, we, can, we can start with that. And then I'll kind of wrap up on our objectives with outreach following these kinds of projects and initiatives and what we hope to, uh, to see in the future uh, with the proposals we have going on, but also uh, what's going on beyond that. All right, so I will start with uh, CCS stands for carbon capture and storage or sequestration. Uh, and the premise is, is basic. It's a process whereby you capture uh, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 being very plentiful, abundant and on the rise faster than it's naturally forming and uh, capture that at the source. So that would be uh, a combusted facility uh, where greenhouse gas is being produced or you can capture it out of the atmosphere through ambient capture called, uh, referred to as direct air capture or DAC, and then pump it underground permanently. Um, so that's the goal. In order for that to happen, let me just see if I can turn a laser pointer on. You need to have certain requirements. Um, I mean, Arizona does not look like this layer cake diagram, this cartoon model. Uh, but it hopefully gets the message across that we need these aspects. We need a cap rock. We need a place to put uh, liquefied CO2 at depths generally greater than 800 meters or 900 meters, uh, about 74 bar. Um, and in water that we, uh, we're not going to use, so this would be highly saline water greater than 10,000 ppm. Uh, and generally at these kinds of depths, uh, that is the case and sometimes up to 200, uh, 250,000 ppm. Uh, and ideally with minimal risks, uh, we're, we're a seismic, uh, a low seism seismic region, but that doesn't mean we're free without seismic risk. Generally that come with CCS injection are induced seismicity. 
And um, <clears throat> there's there's several different ways to store that. I mean, ideally, we, most CCS sites around the world are targeting deep saline aquifers, which we do have. Um, but we have about 30 or 40 years of experience injecting CO2 into oil and gas reservoirs, whether they be current and you enhance oil recovery by doing that method, or you can go into a depleted oil and gas field or a coal mine and extract uh, those resources while injecting CO2. You can also inject it into rocks that are favorable and reactive, uh, such as carbonate, um, sorry, calcium, magnesium, and iron bearing rocks are highly reactive with C CO2. So you can create a new rock out of that. And basement is not entirely off limits uh, going below those because of the nature of the, the fracturing in our state. Uh, so uh, why CCS? Well, we, we do have a, a global uh, climate uh, crisis, uh, not just globally, but in Arizona, we, we can show that the temperatures are on the rise uh, every month of every year. Uh, the trends just keep going up. You know, we do have problems with water supply versus water demand. Uh, we're in a mega drought. You know, we've got a lot of problems and uh, we think that CCS is, is just one tool for mitigating and ameliorating the effects of negative climate change. Um, so that's that's why. Um, what, you know, we are in an energy transition out of these, these fuels into different feedstocks uh, to power our economy. And so as part of this energy transition, we see Arizona as having a high potential to accommodate uh, not only just getting to a place where we can sequester CO2, but having to do that over the next 20 or 30 years during the transition, because we can't flip a light switch and expect it to be all green. It's gonna take a good 20 to 30 years to get through the transition. So we see Arizona as having a, a high potential to accommodate that space. Uh, we are on the carbon utilization and storage partnership. So this is, one of four Department of Energy uh, regional initiatives in the US that's funded by the DOE to basically look at the, the data and the CO2 sequestration potential, either for the state or individual sites. And a huge part of that is engaging with the stakeholders and providing outreach to the community, the, the industry, the regulatory partners, um, the energy providers, um, everybody. And so as part of CUSP, we are 14 states and three national labs. Um, our, our goal here is to provide that characterization with the support and engagement of our energy partners that we're involved with now. So that would be uh, APS, TEP, SRP, and then tri-state universities. We have Nikola Motor Company in Southwestern that we're working with and a few other industry partners. Um, so that's where we are with our CUSP project. It's been nice because we can leverage this project to help advance our uh, proposals in this space. So with that said, um, I'll turn it over to Lisa to, to introduce you to what resources we have in the state. Thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, so through CUSP, we initially targeted many of Arizona's uh, sedimentary basins for study, largely like a white paper study um, on uh, what resources were, were available to us for CO2 sequestration. And um, that cusp has been ongoing for the last two years, and that largely followed in the footsteps of other uh, CO2 sequestration efforts that have been ongoing at the survey for the last 15 years, like West Carb and Net Carb. Um, that conversation started changing about a year ago when um, uh, hydrogen got introduced into, uh, into our conversations with our stakeholders. And all of a sudden, there was a huge push to understand how we can store hydrogen uh, underground as a resource to be recalled for short-term storage uh, and energy storage. Then last November, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. And that Inflation Reduction Act fueled enormous amounts of um, money into uh, researching and advancing the efforts towards CO2 sequestration and hydrogen sequestration. And essentially, 
nearly every, almost every week, the base analysis research team and Brian leading it up has been uh, approached by stakeholders across the state and across the West who are interested in storing CO2, storing hydrogen, storing CO2 for permanent uh, 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 purposes and storing hydrogen for um, uh, short-term storage. And so that really led us as a group to start to think about uh, this carbon storage ecosystem that we want to present to you and, and our ideas and perspectives around that. Um, so as part of that, I'm just going to go through each one of the subsurface resources that we have in Arizona and introduce you to them. Uh, next. Yeah, so the first part of this ecosystem are the Cenozoic sedimentary basins in Arizona's basin and range. There are 57 uh, basins that have been identified that are sufficiently deep that are below this, uh, that have sufficient uh, uh, sediments below 800 meters depth, which is the depth through which CO2 can remain supercritical under pressure. Uh, those basins are filled with porous and permeable sedimentary volcanoclastic rocks. Uh, they may or may not have seals. Um, and so we're looking at those basins initially to uh, seek out areas that have potential for stacked saline resources, or excuse me, storage. Um, that effort in most of those basins has been kind of throttled by the lack of uh, deep borehole data and the lack of understanding of the stratigraphic architecture of most of the basin and range basins. Uh, that said, there's much potential and Tanya will speak to one of the basins, Harkohala, where we've been investigating um, and furthering the research into whether we can store CO2 in a stack saline environment. So next. So the second thing here is that Arizona has deep uh, paleozoic sedimentary basins. I don't think I'm telling most of this audience anything new here um, on the Colorado Plateau, specifically in the Holbrook Basin. Uh, we have known marine evaporate deposits. We have uh, units that are extremely permeable lying below them, the Supai group. Um, we also have a permeable uh, Coconino sandstone aquifer that lies below the Chinle formation and the Mongkopi formation. Um, this is an area where we can uh, uh, kind of exploit the sealing potential, the known sealing potential there to potentially store CO2 in the permeable reservoirs. Um, and is an area that already has known um, uh, LPG sites that have been operating since the 70s. So that have been successful in salt caverns in those marine uh, bedded evaporate deposits. Uh, next. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you switch it. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Um, the map is the same, and my eyes didn't pick it up. Okay, so uh, Arizona has salt. Um, you know, it's a very, uh, the, the, the study from Rousey in 2002 identified known salt deposits around the state. Um, this map here is colored in orange, yellow, and gray. The dark orange, the Holbrook Basin and Luke Basin are two basins where we have known uh, discovered bedded salt deposits that have been already exploited for L LPG caverns, like I mentioned, since the 70s. They've been safely operating since the 70s. We have two other basins, Picacho and Red Lake, Picacho being southeast of uh, Luke and Red Lake all the way up in the northwest corner of the state that are currently being uh, explored for um, salt cavern storage. Picacho will probably initially start out as an LPG site, whereas Red Lake will uh, is targeted for a, uh, a hydrogen site. So we, we know we have salt. Um, the other basins here in colored in gray are likely salt deposits, but we are missing the deep subsurface information, um, borehole data, um, geophysical logs, seismic to really understand the stratigraphic architecture and if that salt is, is actually there. Um, but they are basins that are sort of have a similar uh, tectonic uh, and structural history as the other basins with known salt deposits. And so um, these are areas that we're looking towards to further some exploration. Okay, next. Um, Arizona has basalt. So 
52,000 square kilometers of the state, the surface area of the state is covered in uh, mafic volcanic rocks. And that means we're talking about both basalt lava flows and scoria cones uh, and their related deposits, agglomerates, spatter, et cetera. Um, there's extensive Miocene to Quaternary mafic volcanic fields and distributed volcanism around the state. And that includes the San Francisco volcanic field, the Hopi Buttes on the Colorado Plateau, the Springerville volcanic field, Geronimo San Bernardino down in the southeastern portion of the state, the Pinacate volcanic field, which straddles Mexico and the US border, and then distributed volcanism throughout the basin and range largely. Um, this area of research of CO2 sequestration is not necessarily new. It has been uh, and has been done both in Iceland and in Washington and Oregon. But it is, um, in, in terms of the science, it's actually pretty simple. We're taking uh, magnesium and calcium rich rocks, reacting them with CO2 to form carbonate. And um, this happens naturally over long periods of time on the surface of the earth. Um, and we are looking into uh, how we can advance and accelerate that reaction to form new carbonate rocks that then can be used for um, other resources like, for example, landscaping stones. Um, not only does Arizona have a lot of mafic resources at the surface, we also know that much of those lavas may be buried in the sedimentary basins in the basin and range. So this is an enormous potential um, that hasn't yet been tested or uh, explored in Arizona, but we are pursuing projects that we'll talk about a little later in this talk. I will say that it's been successfully done in Iceland where um, the, the project there is called CarbFix and uh, they've been able to successfully dissolve uh, CO2 in uh, highly saline water, pump it underground into fractured basalts and mineralize carbonate, permanently store that CO2 as carbonate as rock within two years. So uh, that's something that we are looking into here in this state. Next. Okay, Arizona has helium. Um, back in May, uh, Kirk Consinius gave a really excellent talk on all the helium resources to the AG AGS. And I'll direct you to that talk if you wanna know a lot more and much, much more from an expert on helium in the state. Um, but this is, a, this is a really a shoulder um, idea and, and it's really a conceptual idea that uh, we've had helium being uh, mined in the state uh, for many, many years. Uh, those helium resources were at the time, um, I'm trying to look at my dates here. Yeah, back in the night, since the 1960s, at the height of the production, the concentrations of helium in Arizona ranged from eight to 10%, which was the highest in the world. That compares to other productive helium fields that may be 0.4% in the Middle East. That helium, uh, where it was being produced was from the Holbrook Basin and trapped in anticlinal domes, um, at first uh, being mined from the Coconino Sandstone, and then more recently from the um, Shinarunk Conglomerate. And so the idea here is um, the helium resources have largely been, uh, been reduced to a point where they may not be recoverable anymore. And can we use CO2 to pressurize the aquifers, which are sort of famously under-pressurized, and force the helium that is left or remaining um, into the anticlinal domes from which we can recover. This is all really conceptual scientific ideas that, um, again, Brian will speak to a little bit more in terms of future projects that we're going to be working on. So next. Um, geothermal energy, another idea that hasn't been explored here in the state. Um, I'm just going to read because I want to make sure that I get these numbers right here. In 2020, there was a paper by the authors Wu and Lee in the journal uh, Geothermal Energy that estimated that hot, dry rock at a depth of 3 to 10 kilometers contains 30 times the energy of global fossil fuels. And theoretical calculations indicate that a 20 degrees centigrade reduction in the temperature of one cubic kilometer of hot dry rock 
can provide the thermal energy to power a 10 megawatt electric generator for 20 years. That's a lot of numbers and, and, and uh, measurements there. But the point is, is that we have a lot of hot, dry rock that has been um, uh, that is uh, available to us in the basin and range as a result of millions of years of extension in those locations. So the idea here is to use instead of water in a geothermal production well to uh, compress CO2 into a fluid, a supercritical fluid, pump it through the injection well, have that supercritical fluid absorb the thermal energy of the hot dry rock in the basement areas of fractured basement of the basin and range, that fluid then returns to the surface through a production well and the energy can be used to power our energy facilities or other CCS related projects or geez, whatever you want it to power. So this is um, something that can be coupled with other CCS and, uh, and hydrogen storage opportunities in the basin and range. Next. All right, the, uh, the final resource here, and maybe one of the most critical ones that I think a lot of people think of is that um, a lot of this is gonna require water and where are we gonna get it from? Um, so, you know, the, the, the great thing is, is that chemically um, dissolving CO2 in, in saline water is much more beneficial than dissolving in fresh water. So we need a hypersaline resource for, uh, for CO2 uh, fluids to be pumped um, successfully underground. Uh, we have three known um, basins that are hypersaline, Luke, Picacho, and Higley, which are highlighted in the um, red stars on the map. And in this chart here where you're looking at uh, essentially well depth on the y-axis. So as you go down, the, the deeper the well is. And salinity on the x-axis. So as you go to your right, the water is becoming more and more saline. So these are deep uh, well, well bore um, uh, water geochemistry measurements for, that are greater than 10,000 uh, TDS, and they're much, much further below our 800 meter target line for CO2 sequestration. Um, I will say that some of this data, when you see, you may not be able to see the key in the bottom. Um, the data represents several basins from around the state, um, but much of it is um, biased in the sense that you see a lot of fresh water our boreholes, and it's just really the lack of deep borehole data where we really don't understand which basins um, are highly, uh, have highly saline re water resources for us. And we'll say though that um, uh, the, you know, if basins contain uh, salt and if they're closed, um, like the other uh, potential salt body basins that we have located here on the map, it is very likely that they have a saline water resource that we can use that really no one else wants. That's non-potable and not usable for agriculture. Next. Okay, so um, the there was a figure on the cover slide that Mike had up um, before as we're starting the presentation. And I just wanna take you through like what our conceptual idea is for, um, for what this ecosystem could look like. One in the basin and range, and the other on the plateau. Uh, next. Okay, uh, the basin range CO2 ecosystem. So the idea here is um, we have a number of um, interstate corridors. We have the I-10 corridor that goes through the basin range serving Phoenix to Los Angeles. We have the I-8 corridor from Phoenix, Tucson, San Diego. And we have a future I-11 corridor that runs from Phoenix to Las Vegas. Um, this is all within, contained within the basin and range, and therefore contained within these 57 deep sedimentary basins that we have a potential to source CO2 and, uh, and hydrogen in it. So the first part of this ecosystem is a source. Brian, do you mind just clicking through the um, circles um, as we go? So um, we have many, oh, sorry, no, go back. <laughs> we have many uh, many potential CO2 sources, right? I mean, we really don't need a source. We can get CO2 directly from the air with direct air capture units that ASU is uh, currently researching and building. But we can also we also have known CO2 emitters throughout the state. These are um, are are mostly our power facilities, but also our cement facilities that are emitting enormous amounts of CO2 per year. And these, these energy companies um, and, uh, and industrial companies 
want to reduce the amount of CO2 that they're emitting. They have target goals for zero emissions by 2030 or 2050. And they're really looking to um, not only reduce the amount of CO2, but completely get rid of it. And in some cases be um, net negative CO2. So we have our sources and those sources are already situated in areas around our basin and range basins. So next we have our CO2 injection wells. Um, in the basin and range, we, we've established that we have the potential for stacked saline resources. Um, we need to find the ceiling and cap rocks in many, many basins. We don't know if they're there. We suspect they're there. Uh, what we've shown on this diagram is a large bedded halite um, deposit that may be interbedded with anhydrite or gypsum or other evaporite deposits. It also may be interbedded with siliciclastic rocks. So this is something that we're trying to better understand. Um, so we can inject CO2 below those capping seals permanently in our stacked saline reservoir. Next, um, we have the potential for H2 injection wells, which we're focusing on uh, in salt caverns. So creating salt caverns through salt dissolution and being able to store hydrogen in there for um, to be recalled in times of a deficit. The idea here is to produce hydrogen in uh, using green energy, solar or wind, excuse me, using hydrogen to store the energy produced by solar or wind power, pump that hydrogen underground and recall it at times of deficit in the winter time in order to power energy facilities. That hydrogen storage next would require a saltwater disposal well, which we could do because we already have saline aquifers. And then next, um, what about our um, mineralization in basalt? We have known uh, distributed mafic resources throughout the state that include scoria cones and basalt lava flows. They're not only on the surface, they also may be interbedded with rocks at, the, at, at depth. And next, the potential of our clean energy power and enhanced geothermal CCUS. Um, using our hot dry rock resources and fractured basement. This is what the ecosystem could look like in uh, the basin and range. And next, Brian. Um, the ecosystem on the Colorado Plateau is very similar, just in a different uh, stratigraphic framework. So we have our CO2 sources, which are right there in the center, um, which include power facilities in the Springerville area. Next. Our CO2 injection wells and permeable rocks that lie below known bedded salt deposits, which would serve as a seal. Uh, next, our H2 injection wells, where we could either convert the current LPG wells or uh, make new um, new salt cavern, excuse me, convert the uh, current LPG salt cavern storage areas or uh, create new um, salt caverns in that bedded halite. Uh, next, we have uh, the Springerville Volcanic Field, the San Francisco Volcanic Field, and the Hopi Buttes all on the plateau, all areas where we could mine scoria for uh, mineralization and basalt. And next, the possibility of enhanced helium recovery um, in the Coconino. Well, I have it drawn there in the Coconino, but this is schematic could be in, uh, in also in the uh, Shinrump conglomerate as well. You know, can we use CO2 to pressurize that reservoir and kind of force that helium up into the anticline to mine that? Um, so this is what a, a potential ecosystem would look like on the plateau, and that ecosystem could serve the Four Corners area, the Navajo Nation, the I-40 corridor from Albuquerque to Los Angeles, as well as the Hopi Nation, the White Mountain Apache Nations. I um, believe that's all for my part, and I think I'll turn it over to Tanya to talk a little bit more about a specific basin where we've been uh, evaluating for CCS. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Um, so as Lisa said, I'm going to be talking about a specific site um, potential for potential CCS, um, talking specifically about Harklahela Valley, um, which is where we've been doing a pre-feasibility study to better understand the CO2 sequestration potential as part of our CUSP focus project. So this research is funded by um, the U.S. Department of Energy. Next. All right, so um, to get you acquainted with the area, we'll first start by looking at the map on the left. Um, 
so Harklahela is an agricultural rural valley. It's in the southwestern um, part of the state, about 60 miles west of Phoenix. Um, it's a flat plain that occupies about 500 square miles and is surrounded by several different uh, mountain ranges. So um, let's see, Interstate 10, which is the gray line, cuts across the basin, as does CAP, which is the um, Central Arizona Project Canal, which delivers Colorado River water to the greater Phoenix area. The green dot in the um, northwestern part of the basin represents the Vidler groundwater recharge facility. And the, the purple lines on here are the natural gas pipelines. And this connects um, four different um, natural gas energy facilities in the area, three of which run year round and um, are located in the map with the orange stars. And these are powered by um, Capital Power, SRP and APS. Um, just to the north there is the nation's largest uh, nuclear power plant, which is the Palo Verde Generating Station. So why did we choose this location? Why Harquahela for um, a potential storage site? Well, based on the available gravity information we have, um, particularly from Richard et al., um, and those are actually the, the contours you see on the map in light brown, those show the depth, the depth of the basin. So we know that this basin is deep and has sufficient volumes for storage. And there are three potential geologic storage types here, which is advantageous, such as the um, saline aquifers, which would be great for liquid CO2 storage. Bedded salts are likely here for hydrogen storage. And then basalts, which are um, likely interbedded with the basin fill and surround the basin um, to be used for CO2 mineralization. Um, with the presence of salt here, there's a potential for large volumes of that saline groundwater to be used for um, future industry. There's also favorable geothermal potential, so harnessing that power um, to produce electricity to again support future operations in the area. The basin is close to these large energy producers. Um, so these three producers in the southwest, excuse me, southeast part of the um, map. Um, cumulatively, in 2020, they emitted, um, I think it was 5.4 million metric tons of CO2 um, waste just into the atmosphere. So there's point sources here and potential for us to capture that carbon and permanently store it underground locally. Uh, the I-10 here provides a great transportation corridor between southern Arizona and California. And there's no active um, seismicity in the area, so the seismicity risk is low here. But one of the um, geologic risks that we need to assess is the um, ceiling potential, which is relatively unknown here. Um, it's likely with the salt, um, but there's more data that needs to be collected for us to fully um, characterize that aspect. The next slide, please. All right, so for our basin analysis study of Harquahela, we've looked at um, different publicly available data sets and integrated them for the evaluation. So on the screen here, I have four different um, images that represent some of the data sets we've been working with. For example, um, we've compiled um, multiple geologic maps into one map for the region. We've looked at available well data, and we've cataloged and coded those wells based on their um, lithologic logs. We've looked at um, both public and a proprietary gravity data set and integrated that into our evaluation. And then we've looked at a set of vintage 2D seismic lines in the area. And the, the 2D seismic was reprocessed for us by NOCA Geophysical. And then that data was managed and interpreted by Roy Johnson and Kurt Constinius. So um, in addition to these data sets, we've also looked at um, water chemistry, trying to um, better understand salinity at depth. And we've looked at wellbore temperatures to get a better idea of geothermal potential. But some challenges that have arisen out of this are mostly with data availability and quality. So for example, we have insufficient well information. 
So the graph on the upper right um, shows the depth in meters on the y-axis, and the x-axis shows the wells with borehole logs in no particular order. So essentially the wells, um, none of them are much deeper than 500 meters. Again, this is an agricultural basin. A lot of these are water wells, so they're very shallow. And the red area represents our potential storage reservoir, which starts around that 800 meters, which as Brian had mentioned earlier that this is kind of um, the depth at which the pressures would be great enough to keep CO2 in its liquid state. So we have no deep well penetrations. We don't have any um, good information about the potential reservoir itself. Um, the quality of the well bore logs or the drillers logs varies, um, can be fair to poor in some areas, and there's no petrophysical logs, so no acoustic information that could help bolster some of our seismic evaluation. As far as the seismic goes, um, it is legacy data and the quality varies, and some of the acquisition methods are a bit antiquated, um, and some of the data was missing, so it created some challenges for reprocessing, um, but it actually turned out um, very well for us. And then the last point here is just that um, the basin is not dissected, um, so there's not basin fill exposed that we could go um, sample our map. Next. All right, so I'll jump into the preliminary findings for our basin analysis study here. And again, this work is still ongoing. Um, so I'll first describe the two images I have on the screen. So in the bottom left hand corner is an example seismic line. And this is oriented from southwest to northeast. So the blue line can matches the blue line on the um, adjacent map. So the seismic line is essentially perpendicular to the strike or the basin axis. Now this map, um, this is a subsurface map of the base of the lower basin fill. So if you look on the seismic line, the lower basin fill is that orange polygon there. Um, so that represents that surface. And this contour map um, has warmer colors representing more shallow areas and uh, cooler colors representing deeper areas. The red lines on the map are possible subsurface faults um, based on the seismic interpretation. So some key points here are that uh, we were able to break the basin up into distinct units. So on the seismic line, you have the upper basin fill in yellow, the lower basin fill in orange, and then the lower reflective package in purple. And that lower reflective package is likely um, Miocene volcanic and older rocks that we can um, tie into the outcrop. And I will say here that um, we've been working on characterizing adjacent basins to Harquahela, and that has been extremely helpful in understanding this basin. So again, you have to kind of look beyond the basin margins to really get the full picture here. So the lower basin fill in orange is the unit that likely contains salt deposits. Um, the character of the seismic, uh, of the reflectors, the reflectors become transparent in some areas within this unit. And this is similar to what is seen in the seismic for Luke Basin, for example, where we have known salt deposits um, in active current storage of LPGs. Um, there's also analog basins um, surrounding this area that have similar tectonic and depositional histories that have known salt, like Picacho, for example. And there is a proprietary gravity, um, gravity uh, or petrophysical study that did uh, indicate salt in the area as well. So um, this is considered a modified half graben, and we have the primary high angle normal fault on the southwest margin of the basin, um, kind of at the base of the Eagle Tail Mountains. And then on the map there, you can see the main depot center um, is a long gate and strikes northwest southeast. So we still have a little bit more work to do um, calculating thicknesses and volumes here. Um, but overall, moving forward, you really need more information to further de risk this basin for, for storage. Um, namely with through a characterization well. And we're currently working with um, industry partners 
to for a phase two of this project where we're hopeful that we will um, acquire more data here. So next slide. All right, so we're going to wrap up this section with just some key takeaways. Um, Lisa mentioned that Arizona has a very unique uh, geologic history, which has created um, extensive sedimentary basins throughout the state, which um, are capable of storing CO2 and hydrogen, among other things. Uh, our subsurface resources are plentiful, and it's not just the traditional copper or um, mineral resources, but we do have things like world-class helium deposits, a potential for stacked staling storage. We have extensive high magnesium basalts that we could use for CO2 mineralization. We have basins full of salt for potential hydrogen uh, storage. And we even have geothermal potential and hot dry rock within the basin and range. So a lot of these resources aren't yet developed um, in this context, but ourselves as well as um, some of our industry partners are working on that. And I talked a little bit about our Harquahela Focus Project and how that is a great candidate for um, a CCS site. And uh, again, there are many deep sedimentary basins throughout the state. There's 57 just in the basin and range, but a lot of these are understudied and underexplored. So moving forward, um, data preservation is going to be very important and um, acquiring new data to better de-risk and understand these basins um, specifically for storage. And lastly, um, partnerships and collaborations are really going to be required to meet these goals. All right, Brian, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, uh, great, thank you. That is nice. Um, the last couple of things that we wanted to wrap up with is that, you know, knowing a little bit about our resources in the context of the CCS, um, what we heard over and over again, meeting after meeting, workshop after workshop, was that um, outreach is sorely needed. You know, uh, there are a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, a lot of um, frustration with the information uh, being supplied out there. So we thought as part of the Harkohala project that we would try and utilize a, uh, an educational outreach tool called a story map. And so I'll briefly kind of introduce what that is. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go to our, our, our web version of this. So these are snippets from that website. It's not live yet because we're still under review. Uh, but a story map is an immersive virtual experience where you, you take um, media from different types, videos, static images, uh, GIF images, that kind of thing, links, uh, basically everything in a, in a map space. So you, you're navigating throughout the map. It could be global, regional, state, a basin scale, a site scale, any scale you want. And as you navigate through these panes, you, you can talk about topics that provide context. So we provide a global uh, climate context of, of temperatures are rising specifically for this basin, specific sequestration in Harquahela, uh, what are the, the storage sites around this part of the state, uh, looking more in depth at Harquahela and how uh, CCS actually works. So we have this little GIF animation of, of how it could work um, and then talking more about the risks and, and the partnerships and uh, communities and uh, in this region. So the story map is, is, is built for, uh, for everyone, but specifically for the stakeholders and the people living in this area to learn more about how it works. And that would definitely include our state uh, and local and tribal governments uh, where they need information to make policy and, um, uh, and address uh, permitting and policy constraints. So. So that's one tool that we have out and it's uh, we expect that in early next year. Another tool that we thought would be helpful was providing uh, an, a subsurface viewer for the state. So this would be a statewide viewer. It's supposed to have multiple layers of data sets, so geothermal data sets that uh, Tanya and Lisa were presenting 
uh, data from other providers like ADWR about hydrogeology, uh, AMA boundaries, basic stuff, uh, surficial geology, and then subsurface geology like the depth to bedrock maps. Where are the sedimentary basins for the Cenozoic, the Mesozoic, and the uh, Paleozoic uh, throughout the state? Uh, where are the point sources? Where are the transportation corridors between uh, those CO2 point sources? And where are the possible sinks? All the well data from ADEQ and the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and ADWR, we can fold into this. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, economic uh, commodities uh, throughout the state. So the idea is that you can navigate, utilize these data sets and download them. And they would be versioned, so you don't have to wait for an open file report every five or 10 years or 20 years. Uh, we can version individual packets of the state uh, using this tool. So that's, uh, we expect to roll out uh, early to the middle of next year. Um, and last slide here is our, our current projects. Uh, we've talked a little bit about CUSP, about it being a statewide initiative. The principal investigator uh, is New Mexico Tech, and they're managing the, the 14 state CUSP initiative. Um, and they're also the lead for the focused project in Huacuajela. Uh, we're also working with NICLA on leading an initiative to characterize the, the, uh, this area for their resources and their energy partners. And statewide, uh, we're working with ASU and the Center for, for uh, Negative Carbon Emissions and ASU Lightworks regarding direct air capture possibilities and potentials throughout the state. For proposed projects, what we, what we have been applying for, uh, we've got one that Lisa had mentioned about direct air capture and mineralization within mafic rocks at the surface. So we're looking at these four volcanic fields based on their mineralogy, uh, but there are many more. So we just have to focus on these four for now. That's been submitted. Uh, this a carbon safe uh, proposal was submitted to DOE last week or two weeks ago uh, for the St. John's area. And so this is uh, for a CO2 injection site around the St. John St. John's Dome. We also have uh, submitted uh, with Proton Green uh, and Utah University, an NSF engines project for enhanced helium through uh, CO2 injection. So that's kind of like enhanced oil recovery, but it's called enhanced helium recovery as a concept because it hasn't been done before. Even the words are brand new. Um, and we will be applying for funding opportunities uh, for phase two for Harquahela because all things point towards uh, its favorability. We just need to move to a phase two and collect more data um, to, to test that idea. We also have two hubs that are coming out from DOE. These are rather large funding opportunity announcements that have kind of hit the floor, kind of haven't hit the floor. Um, but the first one is a direct air capture hub. So it would be somewhere in the, in the cusp region. Um, and then we also have a hydrogen hub that's uh, come out. So we have notice of intents to develop hubs, which are broad, wide, sweep, uh, wide sweeping networks uh, with many partners involved. So these are the proposed areas that we've been working on. We expect to see a lot more coming from uh, the federal uh, government um, in terms of funding opportunities. But then we also have a lot of interest coming from the industry as well and other uh, partners and, and people involved. So we uh, hope, <laughs> we're having a hard time keeping up. Uh, but we are continuing to grow in this area. So we expect that to continue. Uh, so with that said, uh, I'll just say thank you again to Lisa and Tanya and um, for your attention. Thanks, Brian. And, and thanks, Lisa and Tanya. That was, that was really excellent and a lot of information. You guys have pulled a lot together in the last three years. And obviously, a lot of research dollars are coming your way at this point in time. What is, Brian, what's the, uh, when you're looking at the Harquahela, aren't you going to have to use some really deep drilling to actually get some of the answers that you want? Uh, yeah, ultimately, you, you do have to drill. You can't really get around that. Uh, 
you can do geophysics all day long, but right. unless you calibrate it, there's no way. So uh, yes, there is a going to need to be a push to do that. And okay. um, as far as the depth goes, you know, um, it's going to all depend on how uh, the economics line up. You know, in terms of uh, drilling methods and resources and the and the funding to to go into do we want to do it the minimum depth or do we want to explore the hot dry rock you mm -hmm. know to help provide energy for that because are you talking about five thousand feet or ten thousand feet the methods mm -hmm. change quickly so right. um, all of those things have to be taken into consideration when you're going past about five thousand feet. Excellent. There are several uh, comments in the chat, and there may be some questions, so we should look at those very quickly and then open it up to those folks who are standing by. Okay, great. Uh, I've got the first question here is, is mafic rock saline water aquifer better storage than carbonate rock saline aquifer? Um, what type of rocks are better to seal? Just porosity or both rock chemistry. Uh, what type of injection well is needed? Is more expensive to install an injection well for CO2 than to install a water injection well? Uh, all great questions. Um, you know, we don't have a class six injection well for CO2. That's a class six uh, or class five for saline water disposal. Uh, so we don't have that system in place. Um, but in general, um, I, I think that's just going to be expensive no matter what when you're talking about mm -hmm. injecting something at these depths. Uh, CO, the class six requires a lot. It's, it's very similar to a class five, um, but it's got to take into account um, any kind of uh, pressure mechanisms is my understanding. Uh, we're not engineers. <laughs> we're trying to keep up with the, the engineering surrounding this space because we don't have uh, a class six yet, uh, but that's the goal. And so I'm not sure that's going to answer your question. Uh, a better storage carbonate versus a basalt aquifer. Um, I think the basalt aquifer in terms of, of a, a vessel for CO2 reactivity would be better. Uh, because the carbonate is already utilized in a, in a carbonate aquifer. And so you're getting to react with that is not going to be as easy. Before you do that, I just want to address one other question. It looks like in here from okay. Garrity about the basalt mineralization process. Yeah, in Iceland, they are uh, sort of um, taking advantage of high temperature um, subsurface conditions. But um, but actually, um, so that, that proposal that we've submitted is working with um, Jen Wade from NAU and Klaus Lackner from ASU, who both have uh, long research histories in CO2 storage. And Jen is a, a, a um, chemical engineer who is uh, trying to build a reactor to mineralize CO2 in scoria at the surface. And so she would be essentially creating the, the conditions, uh, temperature pressure conditions needed to, um, to mineralize that CO2 in a lab. The other idea is, and, and I literally say this, which may not be uh, well, well taken by people who want to preserve our surface environments, but it is possible to basically grind up a basalt lava flow and spray um, dissolve CO2 and saline water on top of it and let it oh. sit there for many years, um, like a sprinkler system. <laughs> and, and Klaus has, has tossed that around in our meeting. So these are all sort of, I, I don't want to, you know, maybe I'll use the words cutting edge. It's a little cliche, but, um, you know, ideas about mineralization of CO2 at the surface that are theoretically possible. So that's what our proposal is to do and, and also to test uh, the, the chemistry of the salts and scorias around the state uh, that would be uh, but that would be highly reactive in order to to make that successful. Wow, that's really exciting. I think Dan Aiken has a question for you. Yeah, hi, uh, good evening. Thank you for the fantastic talk. I had two two observations, just something to think about. Number one, is there a surplus heat from the Palo Verde plant that could be used to uh, be pulled into the saline uh, brine 
and uh, the heat could be stored and utilized in some way. And then also in, in a similar vein, out at Painted Rocks off of I-8 near the Gila River, there's a, there's a solar field. And one wonders if solar energy could be in some way through heat transfer stored in some of the, the uh, fluid resources that you're talking about, either CO2 or, or saline brine or in some other way to store heat that would be generated from a solar facility, uh, particularly surplus uh, energy that, where electricity could be transferred to a fluid injected and then pulled back and the heat be reprocessed as kind of a battery concept. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, we've, we've, we've heard about these methods in circles um, without the benefit of actually seeing one work, um, like hot sand, um, fluids. Uh, it was one method I've seen a, a couple times. It would be nice to actually see one of these working. Um, and I imagine that um, the engineers at Palo Verde and uh, the other facilities uh, are counting every jewel, you know, <laughs> trying to account for it. So I, I know they are. But um, yeah, in that space, I, I think that what one of the messages we're trying to deliver in this talk is that, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, one tool, you know, five tools, 10 tools, an ecosystem of, of any kind of a method that we can, you know, explore. So I think that in places like this, you, you could, you would apply all of those you know, compressed air uh, energy distribution or, or um, uh, heat storage and, and water uh, in those uh, uh, highly insulated environments. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I it'd be nice to see the discussion continue. <laughs> Brian, Karen has got a question for, for you folks. Uh, she's asking about the major faults on the Harkwa, in the Harquahalen Basin. Are there going to be potential leaks of any CO2 placed in the basement? Uh, yes, that is what that has always been the main concern with the Basin and Range Province is that, uh, you know, it's a broken up uh, province and we, we know we have faults. Um, and as far as their ceiling potential, it's not understood, at, hardly at all. Uh, you know, we can see some of the faults that have ruptured the surface, or obviously those would be quaternary faults. We'd stay away from those. But in basins that have been exposed, it's still not even clear, you know, what these faults would look like at depth. Mm -hmm. And it is a major concern. So one of the ways that we're trying to address that is to... Um, think about it as part of the characterization process, but also kind of stay away from it. <laughs> um, so if these basins are truly as voluminous as they appear to be, then we're talking about a few tens of millions of tons in a space of a few hundred cubic kilometers. So a potential future CO2 site, sequestration site would be this flat little pancake the size of two or three square miles and a few hundred feet thick. Uh, we wouldn't want to do that right near a, fault, a known fault zone. Um, and with the acquisition of new high resolution 3D uh, uh, velocity uh, images, we can really see more about not only just that fault, but the subsidiary faults that, that are attached to it. I'm not sure the answer to your question, but it's it's always been a concern. Uh, since the West Carb days. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else out there who would like to unmute and ask these guys a question? Sure, I, I've got a question. Um, excellent presentation, by the way. Um, so I'm, I'm online looking at a map um, for kind of deep borehole penetrations for the state. And it looks like, you know, the majority of them that you would have available to you would be on that northeastern corner where you're catching the edge of the Paradox Basin and San Juan Basin. Um, I realize those are probably going to be a fair ways away um, from some of the infrastructure or major CO2 source sites. Um, but have you all looked looked in that corner much at all? Uh, no, the San Juan Basin is it, it's 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 wonderful. They've got almost a couple hundred thousand wells, um, uh, petro, you know, petrophysical logs included. So. <laughs> They are a data rich state. 
they have too much data and and we have too little uh even in spilling over across the border that basin doesn't really come too much into our space and neither do the seals and the uh the storing environment isn't isn't really favorable across our border um but that the great thing about having the San Juan Basin as a neighbor basin is that it's been shown to be a highly favorable target. And so they're moving full speed ahead with not only just uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, but also hydrogen storage in the Permian rocks, uh, which we have. So we would leverage what we do understand about uh, sure, uh, other exploration in that less. corner of the state. I'm not sure that answers your question, but. It's it's amazing how quickly the, the the number and of logs drop off west of New Mexico. Lisa Lisa has her hand up. Lisa, were you going to say something? Oh yeah, there was just one comment in the string I wanted to address, okay. um, and it is uh, doesn't CO two sequestering let source generators off the hook for reducing CO two? I think this is a really important point. Um, so we've worked really closely with SRP and APS and TEP since the beginning on our CUS project, and uh, they individually have net zero carbon emission goals that are either 30 or 50 year goals, I can't recall mm -hmm. which. Um, so they are reducing their uh, CO2 emissions um, sort of intrinsically. Um, and they're looking towards the future and largely much of that is going to be uh, taken care of through the transition to hydrogen burning energy facilities. So that's really what their goal is. Now, even with the production of hydrogen, that comes along with an emission in, in one case called blue hydrogen, we're using electrolysis to split methane, you are both producing mm -hmm. hydrogen and CO2. So when they're producing hydrogen, they're going to want to capture the CO2 off of that production process and bury it and not emit it. So that's really where we've been working with energy facilities to sequester, permanently sequester the CO2. Um, I can say that they are not looking to, say, you know, install scrubbers or capture units on their current facilities as they are, because that would be too expensive for them. They're just like, skipping that and going right towards uh, converting over to hydrogen. So that's where the hydrogen part of the ecosystem comes in as well, is being able to both permanently store CO2 and uh, store hydrogen on a short-term basis that can then be recalled later for use by the energy facilities. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah it does take some time to retrofit these plants. Um, it can be done. And Farnsworth is one of the best, better examples that's undergoing that retrofitting process. So um, that's why they call it the energy transition, because it's a transition out of this. It's, it's going to take a few decades, um, but it doesn't let them off the hook. Uh, and that's uh, mainly coming from initiatives, uh, subsidies, uh, and, and pressure, you know, uh, uh, is the way I would frame that. A lot of these basins would really benefit from seismic. You had that legacy data, um, but it seems to me that if you're really going to try to get a handle, you know, handle on what's going on in these deeper basins, especially the high resolution, you want to you you really want to supplement it with um, whatever geof you may not be able to afford the seismic right now, but in the future you might. Um, it seems like in your when you're drilling any kind of deep well, that's a fairly expensive endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, that it, you might want to at least always push for some sort of minimum suite of geophysical logs and perhaps even include uh, velocity surveys. Um, it may add to the cost for now, but in the future, if you get the opportunity to run 2D lines or even a 3D survey, 3D seismic survey, it could really be helpful. Um, I, I know my experience from in the oil patch is um, you may be able to get a nice seismic survey in the future, but suddenly you realize all your old wells you're, are lacking velocity surveys. And a, a true velocity survey is a little bit better than building up a velocity model out of a, a sonic logs. Um, so it's, it might be just something to think about when you're sort of 
something to toss at anybody if you ever get the opportunity to drill a deeper well is to make sure you've got a minimum speed of logs. Yeah, that's a good point. I think we would probably run as many logs as possible. That's probably <laughs> almost as, as expensive as the well itself. But uh, um, yeah, that's definitely uh, uh, would happen. And, and we also have other tools at our disposal, like something like a vertical seismic profiling uh, that would be, you know, would go out to at least a you know a mile or so from the borehole um, to capture some pretty high resolution stuff. But without the depth migration, it will be uh, uh, just a, a never ending challenge. Right. Well, I think Dave Reynolds out of the uh, Geological Society of Nevada has got a question or a comment. I was just observing that, uh, you know, seismic is a great risk reduction tool in the oil industry. And I'm a processor that has a few years of experience in just trying to leverage surface seismic before you do too much more drilling may be a, a, a cost-effective way to help plan your wells a little bit better. Um, 2D lines will work in this area. It's not necessary to have 3D depth migrated data. And it gives you a lot of information uh, I don't know the cost ratio, though, because I wasn't involved on the cost end. Thanks. Now, that's great to hear that reinforced. That's actually our our <clears throat> next phase two proposal is to is to do some uh, cost effective methods of high resolution gravity, uh, some low uh, flying uh, aerial mag, and then supplement that with 2D seismic and maybe 3D seismic along those lines that we now have enough information to say, okay, well, let's let's reshoot this uh, or let's fill in this data gap here where there's no data, but we can leverage the, the vintage data with that. Um, and, and those are pretty cost effective uh, tools, you know, ahead of a, 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 a characterization well or two. I'll just Brian? add to a one project that we didn't mention on our sort of ongoing or proposed projects is we're separately funded through um, through state map to build a 3D subsurface model of Big Sandy Valley. Uh, that wasn't mentioned before, and it's not CCS uh, specific, but uh, Donna Shillington is on this call from NAU who's advising uh, a, a new master's student, Emily Kunkel, who will be reprocessing uh, legacy seismic lines in Big Sandy Valley as a part of our state map 3D subsurface model for the next two years. So that will help us at least get an idea as a proxy, uh, one other proxy, 2D seismic for another uh, basin range transition zone type basin. Lisa, please uh, copy me on anything that she's working on because I would love to volunteer some time. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Dan Aiken, did you have another comment you wanted to make? Yeah, uh, I was involved a little bit with uh, evaluation of the Cypress Tohono mine over on the Tohono Atom Nation. Uh, this was back in the 80s, but uh, the people from Lakeshore had been back pressuring uh, their their ore body. They had uh, chrysocolla and they were they were uh, pressure leaching chrysocolla, but they had a whole series of wells around that they injected uh, fluids to back pressure. And one wonders if, if the uh, area that's gonna be focused on in these basins is fairly compact, if one couldn't put a screen of wells around uh, the deposit that one was interested in and back pressure in order to uh, restrict the, the CO2 from migrating towards structures by creating a separate pressure field that would control and keep in place the uh, CO2. And then also from the oil industry, uh, they inject polymers into structures and create uh, walls with the polymer that restrict the migration of fluids and, and so that they can go and control the, the emplacement. I, I think that's just fascinating. I, this, I, I don't know, what do you call that, geoengineering? Uh, but uh, these are the kinds of ideas that um, we're going to have to think outside the box about, you know, you know, if we, if you take on a site and you want to test it without doing too much, um, I mean, you can characterize, characterize a site to death 
you know, before you actually even inject. And at some point you're going to have to inject and, you know, in anticipation of any kind of risk mitigation, I, I like hearing these kinds of ideas because we, uh, we need to have these kinds of discussions about what to do in the event that, oh, well, we see it migrating over here. How can we mitigate that? Because these processes are fairly slow. You could probably react to them in the field. Well, I, I don't think you're going to answer all of the questions that all of these people have or, or be able to hear all of their comments. But this has been a really great presentation. And, and Brian and Lisa and Tanya, thank you so much. I do want to wish everybody a happy holidays. And I want to thank again or acknowledge our Courtright scholars and our Allison scholars uh, for the awards that they've been awarded this evening.